you know, this is our closing speakers. We've had some phenomenal speakers this weekend. I've learned so much and I felt the love from so many different directions. And I had the opportunity to see her a few times in a few spaces in the hospitality room and in the, in the last meeting from last night. So we just kind of like, didn't really talk with her, but we kind of bumped shoulders. And with you all, with that, I want to introduce you all to Rosie B. <laughs> That's okay. I'm an addict. My name is Rosie. <laughs> Nobody has told you they love you today. I love you from the bottom of my heart, mind, soul, body, being, my spirit, my all. I'd like to thank the uh, Western Georgia area for putting on this beautiful convention for the old timers and the, and the geriatric group of narcotics. <laughs> Few things you won't hear in the crack house. Uh, <laughs> Sunday morning, mm. for identification purposes, I'm going to share with you my experience, strength, and hope. And my topic is regardless of. Mm. Sunday morning is the hardest time in the city to get high. I do a lot of walking, a lot of searching. I picked up when I was nine years old, and I immediately had another. Some of you remember Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. <laughs> fell in love that night my sister was supposed to be babysitting for me and her and her girlfriend were getting ready to go to the doo down in uh, Pope Park and they started saying come here we want to tease your hair I said okay now I'm nine years old they're teasing my hair they're putting heels on me and I'm drinking this Schaefer to the straw, and I'm thinking I had arrived. You know, one more thing we got to do to you, Rosie. I said, what's that? And they whipped out a bra, and they stuffed it full of tissue, and I was four foot 11 with B-52 bombers. <laughs> I got on the bus, and their friends were saying, who is that? Who is that? But that toilet paper was too itchy, and I ran into a building as soon as I got off that bus, and I ripped those things off my chest and I said, oh, that's real, so much better for my t-shirt. And the guy said, what happened to you? <laughs> but I had an immediate personality change and it set me on a course of life destruction. And I did not know going into that, that that's where I was headed. You know, um, I robbed the gas station at seven years old. I come from a very poor family. My father died when I was three. And um, my mother was left alone with five children and a mortgage to pay. And she would not accept charity or anything like that. So I grew up, you know, <clears throat> with a woman that believed in corporal punishment. You know, uh, do not spare the rod or the shillelagh. So um, me and my brother, we were in uh, a gang. We joined the gang together, and we were in this gang in the Bronx. And uh, we took hold of the neighborhood. And uh, you know, the last stop is the D train, and the last stop is Two Forts. And that whole entire area was our area. We had 300 acres. We had uh, Bronx Park held captive. You could not go into that park at night. Uh, you could not get your pharmaceuticals taken care of if you were sick or ill, if you were elderly, because the drugstore was constantly being robbed, you know. And we thought, you know, who we were. We took over. And that's where drugs, you know, like they separated me from you because there was something inside of me that was very sensitive, very caring, very loving, but you could not afford to let any of the people in this gang, you could not show that, you know, you had hit first, hit hard, hit fast, die young, make a good looking corpse. Mm -hmm. And that was the code of the streets. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, by the time I was 13, I was in the youth house, then I was sent up to reform school. 
And uh, even in reform school, I got high. And I was selling Tetley tea. I was telling everybody, I was selling Tetley tea, rolling it up in the tampon, you know, the paper from the tampon. And I'm selling this Tetley tea and telling everybody how high I am. So they got contact highs. And we were burning bananas because then it was an electrical banana, you know. And we were smoking and toking and smoking combs. and doing anything to get high. And then, you know, I got this bright idea. There was this faction that, that was, uh, you know, the prejudice came in. And there was this faction that was, you know, from upstate and then downstate. And there was this little group in the middle that we were all mixed, you know, we were all mixed. And I was like, let's break into the infirmary. <laughs> you know, Like these are the people I hung out with because I knew they had the shit or did the shit. And, that's who I gravitated to, and I loved them, and they were like my family, you know, being locked up. We got over on everybody. But then it was time for me to come home. You know, I could never get home, but I, finally it was time for me to come home. And when I got home, it was not good. I hooked up with that guy that I fell in love with. All my men looked like movie stars. So the first guy looked like Richard Gere. He was okay. gorgeous. He was gorgeous. He was, he was sharp. So, um, <laughs> so I was with him for about nine years. I'm a long term. I'm with, with men. I, I just, you know, unless it's, it's about the drug, but sometimes men are my drug of choice, you know, with feet. <laughs> so anyway, he, um, we fell in love and everything, and I got pregnant as soon as I got home. I was like fertile myrtle. You looked at me, and I got pregnant. <laughs> and um, he, uh, you know, we. I just told him I didn't want to marry him because I didn't want him to feel trapped. You know, in those days, the guys would feel like they were trapped if the girl got pregnant. So I said, I'm not going to marry you. And he was heartbroken, and he took an overdose that night. And, you know, he was in my lap and he took an overdose and I didn't know that he had a whole bunch of uh, stuff on him. And I got my friend and we got him, you know, you know, the ice on the balls and the whole routine. And he, he came out of it. And when he came out of it, um, we all got busted. But the cops let me go because they thought I was underage. They thought I was 16. So they let me go, but I spent that whole pregnancy going back and forth to court with him and everything. And I, I, we got, I got him off, you know, I got him off. The judge looked at me and I was begging the judge, please. I says, you know, it wasn't his fault. He was in an apartment where drugs were, you know, right. So that was my first uh, encounter with a man. And then um, we broke up and I put my daughter in a foster home because I was so afraid of the system taking my daughter that I figured if I put her in, then I can get her back before they take her because wherever I was, there was drugs. I was always afraid of them taking her because of the drugs. So I'm walking down the street one day and I see this guy about a block long and here he comes, Omar Sharif. Wow. Wow. Fell in love, fell in love, got my daughter back. He didn't even speak English. He was trying to teach me English. And I was saying, you know, the best English you can learn is in bed, right? So I'm, I mean, Spanish you can learn is in bed. So he's going Miami and I'm going Miami and he's going back and forth with me. And he goes, it goes, repeat the repeat. I said, Miami, es buenos dias. He goes, oh, you're never going to learn. But I learned. Because I wanted to hear him on the phone. I was a model. I was making five dollars, ten dollars a garment. You never saw anybody take on or take off clothes so fast in your life. So uh, he had a gambling Jones, and I didn't know about, you know. And OTV moved in in down the block, and he was, you know, taking the money I was making, and he was up to $80,000 with the shies, you know, and I stayed with him, stayed with him, but I said, listen, we gotta go to Gamblers Anonymous. So we go into Gamblers Anonymous, they said, he's going upstairs and you're going downstairs. I said, why am I going downstairs? I said, well, we, for the wives of compulsive gamblers, and that was my first 12 step uh, fellowship, the exposure to, to, to the 12 steps. And I said, okay, I'll go downstairs. Well, I did not think I was powerless over this man. You know, I had control of the money. How could I be powerless over him? 
But then it came a point where I realized I wasn't powerless over him. He wasn't going to stop, didn't want to stop, and want to continue. So that was the end of Omar Sharif. And I moved along, but I had found something out from that, uh, those 12 steps that they really did work in certain situations. And I like those 12 steps. And then we go on to the ever so famous, the ever so popular husband number two. And he looked like, I mean, I went on a long ass run. He looked like Louis De Palma from Taxi. He had teeth like a burglar's file. <laughs> he was short. I was like, who or what? And I married him in a blackout. And I became a terrorizer. I stabbed that poor soul three times in active addiction. You know, and I was, I was really a horrible, horrible uh, woman to be with at the end of my music, you know. Drugs had taken every fiber of humanity out of me. You know, I was a low bottom. I was not no high bottom. I was on the street with a hefty trash line, a bag, my old man, and a 10-year-old child that I brought through hell. You know, some women think that they're good mothers when they're using. I know I wasn't a good mother. There was no report card taking or any of that. I would throw her at the bus, you know, like get out of my face. She was lucky if she ate any food at, and, and was allowed in the bathroom, you know. And I have a lot of guilt and shame involved with that. No amount of ninth step, no amount can take that off of my heart, what I did to my child in active addiction. And I thank God. Thank God that God is a loving and merciful God, mm -hmm. that he took me off the garbage heap of life and granted me this freedom that we all, we all have. You know, regardless of is a topic that I'm very proud of because we don't, we don't um, love you in spite of, we love you because of who you are and what you have done in the past and who your connections were, whether you like it or not. You know, I have a spiritual connection with my higher power. It's my spiritual connection. I don't have to love your God or, or praise your God. I praise my own. My God has taken me to a place where I've never thought I would be on a Sunday morning at, 11, at 10, <laughs> at 10 45. You know, I've been granted this freedom and this reprieve and the disease is only arrested. My honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, it's under lock and key. And I survived. I survived drug addiction. But living every day, a day at a time, the way that we live, it's like hitting the mega lotto. It's better than the best. It's the cream of the crop, you know? Anyway, so I come into Narcotics Anonymous, and now, uh, oh, before I got to Narcotics Anonymous, I ended up in, in detox, you know, with skid marks on my ass, kicking a triple habit. And I'm in this detox, and I'm watching people, and people getting high and putting the pills under their tongue and all this and everything, and I'm watching everybody. Now, I'm used to institutional mode. I'm an institutional girl. I know how to do that stuff real well, and I'm keeping chicky on the, you know, on the door. I'm Vaseline in the doorknob, making sure the girls are getting laid. I'm making money, you know, and uh, the <laughs> nurses could never get in there. You know, that, what's wrong with this doorknob? And I'm like, I don't know. It broke good last night or something, you know, and I got the girl in it. Come on, I'm coming for us. So next thing I know, I'm in a full-blown, uh, I'm going into a full-blown uh, seizure. And because my thing was a delayed reaction because I kept fat so very fed. You know, my disease was always eaten. So anyway, I um, was going into a seizure and the nurse came in and said, oh, we're not getting anybody for you. You're acting. I always wanted to be in pictures, and I was. Mug shots. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> so I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I'm no, I know I'm going out. And I remember, you know, slitting my wrist and praying to God, let's, let me get out of here. Let me get out of this place. Not, let me not live another day the way I have to live. 
Please, God, let the ship be good. Please let it not be the man at the door. Please let this prostitute have more than $13 in this bag I just robbed. She's a good runner. You know, and I, I would be, I would be, those were my prayers. I never connected anything with the word God because I never felt anything was connected with the word God. He took my father when I was three years old. And the only thing I remember about my father was watching him shave. And he had this beautiful, beautiful blue eyes and, you know, sky blue eyes. And I would watch him. And that was all I remember about my father. I never remember my mother holding me or anything like that, but I do remember my father. So here I am, and I'm in this detox, and my windpipe is closed, and my eyes are going back into my head, and I said, please, God, whatever this is going on in my body, I don't want my daughter to, to grow up knowing her mother was a drug addict. Please, God. And a voice came back. That vitamin-enriched LSD from the 60s, man, that's a good residual. What is happening here? <laughs> you will get clean. You will go through many tragedies. You will live well into your 90s. Mm -hmm. And the shaking stopped. And the seizure stopped. And I was like, quiet. I swear, I shook for six months just because I think I heard God's voice. So I went to those, uh, I went to, uh, the next day I went to uh, some kind of priest or something. And I started talking to him. And I said, you know those Ten Commandments? He says, yeah. I said, slap some more stuff on there. That's my confession. He says, no, no, you can't do it like that. <laughs> I said, you know, the easiest off the way. Uh, I says, okay, you know, what do I got to do? He says, you know, you've been sitting here crying for about a half hour. He says, the only requirement for forgiveness is sorrow. He says, and I think God has forgiven you, but you can't forgive yourself. I said, no, I can't. I can't forgive myself for those abortions when I got raped in the after hours and then the doctor left half the baby in me and didn't know I was having twins. Mm. And I went into septic shock and I was dying. <laughs> no, I can't forgive myself for certain things that I put myself in these positions. So he... Um, he said, all right. So I go upstairs, and the next day I get the phone call. The only phone call I got, and it was my aunt. My aunt and my mother were two tough cookies. They were two nurses, okay? And my aunt said, oh, well, I've been praying to Bill Wilson ever since you got there. I said, who the fuck is he, another one of your St. Jude's? I said, it's a wrap. You can't even be praying for anybody for me, you and my mother with those rosary beads. And she says, well... I, she said, what are you going to do when you leave there? I said, they have these AA meetings here, and this guy was on welfare, and he's got a bank account. <laughs> I want to find out how he got that bank account. And, you know, money is a mood-altering drug for me, and I want to know how he could keep a bank account, you know, because I couldn't keep no bank account. Absolutely not. <laughs> Flow was gone. So I went to the uh, – I went to uh, – I, she says, well, I, I, I says, well, who, who was this guy? And she said, well, he was the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I gave him his last drink. I said, you gave him his last drink? I said, why was he drinking if he wanted a, you know, I couldn't figure it out. She says, he had a dream, and God appeared to him in the dream. And um, he told her if, if she gave him his last drink, he would write down the dream. And she had seen that he was different. But my aunt was the type of woman that you ain't getting no drink from her. You'll get kaopectate, you'll get Pluto water. You are not getting no cocktail from this woman. But she gave him the drink and he wrote down the beginning of the steps. Mm -hmm. So these steps had to be part of my life from Gaminon from this conversation, and then I got to AA. And I went to AA, and they said, make coffee. And I made coffee in five groups. See, my MO is, if you tell me get out, I'm putting some Kahlua, some hits of acid. Let's see how you work these steps, you guys. You know, because I thought they were gonna kick me out. I didn't know I could stay. And uh, 
and they were they were nice to me. They were really nice to me. And then my old man, he decides that he's going to mess with one of my sponsees. I had a couple of months and this girl asked me to sponsor her. So he messed with her and he got me pregnant and he got her pregnant. Okay. So uh, I went full term with my son. My son was severely ill. He had over 2,000 seizures. And the only time I held him was when he was dead. And my, I got back to the room and my husband said, now you got righteous get high. I got righteous get high. Slit wrists, stabbing you three times. You really want me to get high? See, I had found a way out. But inside of me, I was always afraid of that thing, set with a time bar, mm -hmm. waiting to go off. And it wasn't the type of thing where it would come up flush and say, just go. It was slow and it was steady. It was steady and it was slow. So six months after my son died, I decided to... Uh, go and speak at a meeting one night for H&I, and, and the guy on the way out says, it's an it's a NA meeting. And all my friends had left the meetings that I had gone to. Uh, I was in a clean and dry meeting. I like wet and wild. But I was in a clean and dry <laughs> meeting. I was in a clean and dry meeting, and they said they're going to go start this thing in NA, but they wouldn't let me go. You know, because I started to look good, feel good, and smell good. But these guys didn't want me going there. And I respect that, so I did what I was told. But he said it's an NA meeting. So I went, NA, AA, what's the difference? There's no difference. Well, there's a big difference. Very big difference. See, in AA, they have suggested 12 steps. In NA, we have we, we, we. We have addiction, but we have we. I like we, I like us, I like ours. I like all inclusive because that is what I wanted when I got here. I wanted knowledge, how to stay away from the first one. Mm. So I didn't have to worry about the 50,000th one. I wanted to know that I, I could get okay with this disease that I have. I wanted to learn. I wanted the information. So I said, Sal, they're reading out of the white book who's an addict. Most of, most of us don't have to think twice about this question. We already know our whole lives and thinking we're centered in drugs in one form or another. Where is this shit, Sal? Where is it? <laughs> we only got two meetings, Rosie. You got to wait a week. I said, shit. I took that little, give me that book. That was my basic text. Mm. I memorized that book. Mm. Get to my first meeting. Go down those smoke-filled stairs, underneath the cloud. <laughs> There's three girls, me, my sponsee, Shari, and a girl sucking toes, and 30 guys. I said, I have arrived. <laughs> half, the, half the room was loaded, half the room was clean. Sometimes the clean side would go to the loaded side, the loaded side would go to the clean side. Meetings were two hours long, and yeah, what we dispensed with those steps and those traditions, let's play cards. Let's play dress up. Let's start a meeting. Mm. Let's start a meeting. Let's start a meeting. You know, if you go home and each one of us right here, right now, make a decision to start a meeting, you get a chance to get somebody else's arms length away distanced from that drug. Only you could do it. This is so important to me that Jimmy K did not get to see what I got to see this weekend. He didn't get to be appreciated like he should have been. Really. 
because it was his more hard-won effort that got this addict to sit in this seat this morning. There's going to be things happen to you that you can't, beyond your wildest schemes in recovery, mm. happen to you. <clears throat> and you don't have to use. You don't have to use. You don't have to be afraid not to use either. You know, we need to welcome newcomers and we need to keep the older <laughs> experienced members around. We need to dial those old numbers that are in those old phone books <laughs> and see where our messengers are. Where are our messages? You know, are they laying up someplace alone with a shotgun? Thinking is this all there is? When they started meetings at conventions and brought people together in unity. Our lit literature is getting great. Yeah, I think it's awesome and everything, but I can only read so much literature. I need the people. I need the members before and after. I need the coffee before and after the meeting. You know, I don't need to go home alone. I need to go and sit with somebody and, and say, what the hell's going on? Because more I get off of my chest, the lighter I feel. So I went to meetings, started meetings, held conventions. I was a convention junkie, you know? Pick up information as I visited various conventions. <laughs> there you go. Uh, you know, it's like, I ain't getting a water shot in this meeting. Let me run to that meeting. Is it this meeting? Is it that meeting? What meeting is it? Where am I going to hear the message? You know what? I needed to sit still and listen to the information. But sometimes I just couldn't do it. You know, I was hyper, still hyper. You know, so I put, I put a lot of effort in. And in the meantime, I fell in love with somebody in service. And a lot of people know him. And uh, we were together for a long time. And I had a great respect for his love for the addicts. And he used to say, I like to get them in groups, Rose. See, I like the one-on-one -on -one in the parking lot. You know, watching the guy go from flip-flop to I got a bicycle. Now I can get to meetings and I have freedom. But Tony Daniel loved groups of addicts because he knew what you suffered. He went all over the country to get clean. And little did he know is all he had to do was pick up a flyer after he shot that bundle of dope. If you think you have a problem with drugs, come to this church basement at Holy Rosary in the Bronx. And it changed his life. It changed his course. We did, uh, we used to talk about jobs that we pulled and scores that we pulled. See, my, my, my drug dealers were the biggest drug dealers in Manhattan. I worked in all the titty bars in Manhattan, Jack's Three Rings Circus, Adam and Eve, 45th, 49th and 9th Hungry Hilda's, and then Wall Street, a block long of titties. <laughs> it was wild. It was wild. They were, they were looking to give me my own house, my own stable. And I knew I had to get out of there. I seen somebody shot and I said, I got to get the hell out of here. They're gonna, it's not going to be good. This ending is not going to be good. And I used to go out with, you know, judges and cops and tell them when they were getting busted. And, and then uh, I, I just seen too, way too much. And I knew, you know, when you step over that threshold and you're using and you just know there's something about to come down here that mm. you got to you gotta go. You got to go. You know, so we were talking about stuff and we just hit it off and we became friends. Then we became lovers in N.A. And, you know, everybody thought we were Mr. and Mrs. N.A. couple and all that baloney. And there goes the slingshots and the arrows in the back and all that, you know, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I would take anything, go any lens, do anything for a drug. Why not in here? That's so, right. That's right. It's, mm -hmm. You could say what you want. Gossip kills. Mm -hmm. Gossip kills. Gossip kills. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to stop gossiping, just think of this. Two women, they want to stop gossiping. 
So they went to their priest and the priest said, okay, go and get a feather pillows and go to your roof of your house, put a knife in it, and then uh, let the feathers go. And the feathers went everywhere. The next day they went, now what should we do? Go and collect those feathers. You know what? Gossip, it goes everywhere throughout Narcotics Anonymous. You know, and some people are good, good service, you know, members and some people aren't. But you know what? That's their lesson. That's their journey. And if they want to shit on Narcotics Anonymous, they will shit on Narcotics Anonymous. It's what am I doing? What is my purpose? My purpose is I'm a gatherer. My purpose is not to fight noise. My purpose is not to, you know, uh, go up against something that has created something that has been saving the lives of many of mm -hmm. us. You know, my purpose is to be a member in good standing with Narcotics Anonymous and not shit where I eat. Mm. You know, you can't step on a bag, step on a bag, step on a bag and expect it to be good. Mm. So these people that are up in here that are starting stuff in Narcotics Anonymous and trying to break it off and schisms and this and that and whatever they're trying to do, they're not doing anything for the purpose of helping that little addict that's sitting there suffering. Try to get clean. Try to hold on to the message. Try to say, can I have a better life? Mm -hmm. Can I have something that I need? This is my medication. Mm -hmm. One addict loving another mm -hmm. is without parallel. We love you. Don't think that you have to use because people amongst themselves are fighting within our group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They want attention. They think they're the squeaky wheel. They think they're going to get the grease, and you know what? That grease will slide them right out the door. Mm. So I'm going on with my life. I'm going on with my life, and Tony started getting sick, and <laughs> me and him were, you know, in and out of relationship and all that baloney. And uh, he started getting really sick. And I said, okay, you guys, if he gets really bad, please call me. And they didn't call me. And I found him in the hospital one time. He had a heart attack. I went to speak at a convention. And they told me he had a heart attack. And I went to see him, and he went to tell me a joke, and he started crying. And I said, don't worry, Tony. You just get your affairs in order. And he's like, what are you telling me? I said, just get your affairs in order, Tony. You need to get your affairs in order. And I said, it's a just in case. You don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what's going to happen next. It's a just in case. So he was sick for two years, and then, you know, he, um, he had hepatitis C and the diet of Betis, the fucking Betis of dye. Mm. He was a I used to make these cauliflowers and tuna fish sandwiches and little stuff for him to make sure he ate right and everything. I make sure his socks were there, the white socks. I would do his feet and everything. And um, I get in the car. I smell chocolate. <laughs> I, I don't know. But I, uh, <laughs> what do you mean you smell chocolate? <laughs> I'm going to glove up on all these rappers come out. Hershey's. <laughs> Butterfinger! I said, I'm not doing this no more. You're a man, you're a grown man, you need your disease. I said, I got you medical coverage. I got you the best of medical coverage. I said, you need to take care of your disease just like you take care of your addiction. And it's a day at a time, it's a day at a time process, you take care of it. Well, he didn't take care of it too good and they cut off his finger and they did all this stuff. He was in ICU and he thought he was hallucinating when I walked in the room. And I said, did you take care of your affairs? Oh yeah, that's taken care of. Why Spa C, who had 15 years clean, took every single penny mm. he had. His child didn't get one penny. And Tony, when she was 11 years old, had put her on a train and said, you go have a nice life, here's a token. And he was supposed to do that amends. And I told him, you need to do that amends to that child. And he didn't do that amends to that child. But I got the chance to do the amends to that child. You know, times we can't do it 
So we need somebody else to do it for us. And I wish it would have given her double the fulfillment that she ever got from, from, from her father, if it was from him. But she joined us. So, you know, if she joined us, two lives in one lifetime. No, there's three. There's three lives in one lifetime. So I'm uh, wandering around this pathway of life and um, doing what I do. You know, I used to love breaking and entering, and I had the keys to houses for the past 38 years. And I made a lot of money, lost a lot of money and everything. And all of a sudden, this uh, uh, day, I was driving from Atlantic City. I was at my sister's, and I was driving from Atlantic City to New York, and I got hit by a car in the front and the back. I was in a three-car accident. Pulled my shoulder out. I should have caged my dog. I didn't. My dog came flying. And instead of thinking about myself, I ran from my dog. And I got hurt really bad. And the um, doctor said, you need to have an operation. Now, me with doctors, when they gave me what I wanted, I swore they were trying to kill me. And when they didn't give me what I wanted, I took what I wanted. <clears throat> so uh, I went to therapy. I tried everything not to have an operation. They put me on the operating table. They came in. They briefed me. I briefed uh, a, a um, girl from AA that if I needed medication afterwards or anything, you ought to hold those meds, you know, because I'll take what I have to take, but after three days, I will not take another pill or anything. So they uh, wheel me in, and uh, the next thing I know, I'm being strapped to the table and everything, and and I just said to myself, wow, this is like really, the room is like very bright. It's a very, very bright room. And the next thing you know, they gave me the medication. Well, I woke up and I couldn't feel my lips. And I said, they gave me something I'm allergic to. Mm. The next thing I know, I couldn't feel my nose. The next thing I know, I was shutting down. Everything was going off. The power was leaving me. And I said, give me something, Jimmy. Give me your words, Jimmy. Mm. Tell me what I need to know, Jimmy. So long as you follow this way, you have nothing to fear. Mm. And I wasn't afraid when I heard him say that. Stroke code, everybody off the elevator, stroke code. We need the stroke team to the operating room. I could hear. That's all I could do, I could hear. And they bundled me up because if you have another blood clot hit your brain, you're gone. They took me into, uh, uh, I don't know where they took me. I'm, I just know once I took went into that MR, MRI, how do you spell that? MRI machine. <laughs> <laughs> I was in, I was in somewhere else. That was very beautiful. And I saw my sister and I saw my brother. And I was like, wow, look at them. They look young. My brother looked like Elvis Presley. Mm. Elvis Presley, Bobby Darren. And uh, my sister was wearing a green dress, Kelly green dress. I said, Kathy, that's not your color, your pastels. And she goes, <laughs> they were talking with their hearts. Mm. And I was like, wow, look at this. I spent 45 minutes with my high power. And then uh, I went back to them and they said, I said, I'm out. And they said, we know, and they backed away. And I came back into my body and they were screaming at me, speak, speak, speak. And I had the King's English beaten into me as a child. And I said, what shall you have me say? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> who is she? <laughs> that was my mother. <laughs> that was my mother. I was just with my mother. Mm. And I was like, wow. 
but I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed. I don't take blinking, I don't take swallowing for granted. They put me in a, um, I don't, ICU for about a week, no meds. I felt like I got shot in the shoulder. No meds. God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Mm. Sent me to uh, uh, downstairs, then sent me to a nursing home. I get into the nursing home. And my bunkie is the methamphetamine dealer from Utah. I said to myself, if you wanted me to do a 12 step, you couldn't just bring it to the fucking meeting. (laughs) (laughs) This girl was beaten, both lungs punctured, her head cracked open, fractured. Uh, He was putting a hole in the wall and telling her she'll fit nicely in there. And she called her mom. She was following the connection all over, all over the United States. And here you come. Here comes the army. Here comes the cavalry. <laughs> and they're coming in and they're meeting Millie and they're seeing Millie and what's Millie's story and I'm telling them Millie's story and the next thing it's you known, what size is Millie? What does she wear? What, how does Millie like her coffee? You know, uh, what can we do for Millie? I said, you can get her a basic tax. I would like a basic tax for Millie. We're going to have meetings in the garden, Millie. Throw on that sweater. I don't want to go to meetings in the garden. I said, meetings in the garden or you ain't getting coffee. Coffee's a motivator. (laughs) I know where Millie is today. She's Mm. with her family. She's in recovery. Those nursing homes are filled with addicts that will never get out or get the choice we have. Never. Mm. One kid smoked a fucking joint. He fell off a building. He's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. He's 18 years old. And not one Narcotics Anonymous meeting going into that institution. Mm. Okay. Whole bunch of people in wheelchairs in institutions as a result of, of, of being active, you know. See, we didn't know when we took that first hit drink, fix, or pill, mm. that we will be led into a life of degradation. And we went willingly, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll. We went willingly. I left that hospital still weak on the left side, you know, walker and the whole nine. But I I was determined to do what my higher power sent me here to do. So I went to meetings, I went to meetings, I went to meetings. And when I couldn't get to meetings, people brought meetings to me. Mm. Six months later, I was up and running. I got on a bike. And I was riding that bike all over that fucking boardwalk all over the place because they told me that would give me balance because I can't even go up on my tippy toes without falling. Okay? But now, Rosie, I'm opening an outreach to the street people because this is what we do. You know, we take it a step further. We ha- have to give people a choice. We take it a step further. So I'm outreaching. I'm going to help people, you know, instead of putting a freaking vial in your hands, I'm going to put a hammer. You know, I'm going to put a stethoscope around your neck, young lady. You're going to be taking, you know, blood pressure and stuff like that. I'm going to reach out to these women, people, mothers with children. I'm going to get them. But there's a storm coming. I said, you know what? I I think we'll have the grand opening next week. Well, this storm came in and it wiped everything out. Mm. The water went up 16 feet. I called Doctors Without Borders. I called Greenpeace. We had no communication. They were robbing anything that wasn't nailed down. People were dying left and right. I lost everything. Everything. 
I mustn't have needed it. Amen. I'm traveling light. Amen. See, the third step is not just us repeating and repeating and repeating the words. Sometimes you got to put it into action. And I lost complete control of my life when I took the third step. I turned my will and my life over with my son to my higher power. And God gave me, God gave me a beautiful, beautiful fellowship. And I called people in the fellowship and we, we fed 150 people the first day. Mm. You know, addicts step up. And not just for addicts either, mm -hmm. you know. People gave me, sent me money. They sent me money to do what you want to do. I want you to use it for you, but you know I'm not going to use it for me. <laughs> No amount of drugs can get me high as Narcotics Anonymous. All right. The people, the people are unbelievable people. Unbelievable. The best of the best, the cream of the crop. So I had nowhere to live. I was homeless. My daughter said, Mom, upstate. I said, <laughs> <laughs> Upstate. So here I am in Sherman, Connecticut. <laughs> Trees and birds and <laughs> raccoons and real skunk. <laughs> Not the kind in hell. I went to the mailbox. I, th I was out walking my door. I turned around, looked. At, I said, "There's a bear over there or something." I'm hallucinating. What is that? was the mailbox, but I said, you know, I hear guns going off and I don't got one. I'm like, wow, this is a little scary for me up here in the woods. But now I'm adjusted. I'm okay. I'm adjusted to it. It's okay. You know, I'm living with people that are using day in and day out. I open that refrigerator. It's full to the max with all sorts of beverages that I don't use anymore. So I always tell the newcomer, you're an arm's length away. You're an arm's length away. You're an arm's length away. January 23rd this year, I'm having an open house, a broker's open house. I said, let me cater it. My daughter just opened a restaurant. Let me cater this and be a nice event. Everything will be nice. And, you know, oh, they drink, Rosie. They drink. People I work with drink. Let me go to the liquor store. I ain't been in a liquor store <laughs> since I was trying to sell a liquor store. Yeah. I get in the liquor store, I'm like, wow, look at this pink little belly. Yeah. Look at this little bottle. And look at this. And like my disease is like, hmm. <laughs> I come walking out with two. And she goes, would you like a bag? I said, no, let me just walk out with these two big bottles of wine. I look like a wine over here. Would you please give me a bag? She gives me the bag, the brown bag, and I'm thinking all these things, all these things that I forgot about. I'm thinking about all of them, right? So here we go. January 23rd. I had words with my broker. She came to the open house and she totally dissed me in front of the homeowner. I don't buy that. I'm doing the top, top job. Yeah, and you're going to do that to me? You're going to wolf ticket, push me out of the way to take over? It ain't going to happen. So we go upstairs and she has words with me. And I said to her, do you not want me in the office? And she goes, don't you heavy handle me. And I said, there's a problem here. And I'll resolve it when I have to resolve it. But there's a problem. <coughs> go downstairs. And somebody says, Rosie, get me, uh, can you get me a white one? Sure. My ginger ale is here. My white wine is here. Her white, his white wine is here. I pour my fucking uh, white wine, the white wine, I poured it into my ginger ale. I wasn't paying attention. This sneaky, slithering mm. piece of shit of disease was on me. And I didn't even know it. So I went, cheers, and I proceeded to go. Spit it back in. 
you would think that my ass was connected to an electrical outlet. <laughs> and here we began. I woke up my disease. I really woke it up. That taste in my mouth. And it drove me crazy. I couldn't sleep. I went to the home group. I told them what happened. I said, I said yesterday, Lordy, Lordy, I'm coming up on 40, and look what the disease tried to pull on me. I said, I'm fighting for my seat now. I want you to watch me, newcomer, old timer, sometime, I'm gonna be timer, whoever you are, watch me. Watch me. And they watched me, and I rocked, and I rolled, mm. and horrible, horrible drug dreams, horrible drug dreams came into play. And I'm like freaking out, thank you. I'm like freaking out, like what is this gonna be, my recovery where I go mentally insane, that I can't sleep at night, that I'm going north and south with feelings, that I'm reacting to things that normally I can turn right over. Mm. I can practice these principles and all my affairs, but I can't practice them right now. I'm like scared. Mm. Fear not fake dances. <laughs> yeah. My little friend over here, Miss Elizabeth, so I was talking about a convention in Atlanta. <laughs> and, blah, 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 and would you, would you, would you? And I'm like, mm, I, mm, I, I don't know. I always leave it up to God anyway, because I'm not in control. I learned that when I was in that stroke, that he had complete control <coughs> and other faith in me to carry out what he needs to get done. See, we can carry the message, but he has to plant the seed and deliver it. So Elizabeth <coughs> talked to Mitch, and Mitch talked to me, and he told me I'm gonna speak at this meeting, I'm gonna speak at that meeting, I'm gonna speak at this meeting, I'm gonna speak at that meeting. I'm gonna speak at the meeting, I know I'm gonna speak, I'm going, I'm gonna buy the ticket, and oh, I'm planning, I'll plan, okay? And then he said, would you speak on Sunday morning? Mm. And I said, wow. That's like the Academy Awards of not cops and knots. Yeah, yeah. Unmerited, unmerited mercy God has given me, allowing me to be clean. How could I say no to Narcotics Anonymous? Southern hospitality has been awesome. <laughs> you all have been awesome. Two weeks ago, I got a phone call from uh, somebody and they said that my grandnephew had left treatment and that he was in trouble. And when they said that to me, I wanted to get a ticket and go down and get him out of Florida. But God has a way. And somebody got a ticket to him. And he's sitting right here, third row. There he is. <laughs> Lost dreams awaken, new possibilities arise. Keep your eye on Dara Griffin. <laughs> he's a kicker. <laughs> He's a kicker. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I was a shit kicker. Uh -huh. I'm a 56er. You know what a 56er is? <laughs> I didn't make it out of the 50s without using drugs. He's a, mm. he's a football player. He's going to be a football star. Mm. You just got to keep the drugs down, yeah. keep the meat and list in tow. Mm. That's the roadmap. The meat list is the roadmap. We're on the journey. Let's enjoy the journey. I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. I'm going to the wheels fall off. Not paralyzed anymore. Mm -hmm. Come on, look at that. I'm 100% now. I'm back 100%. He restored me to 100% of what I was before the stroke. Wow. Mm. Here, 
I love Narcotics Anonymous. I love the fact that I can be a messenger and, and my thing is shit, <laughs> getting shit <laughs> and doing shit. <laughs> I'm free today. I'm free. Jason, I love you. Elizabeth, I love you. Claire, I love you. Donna, I love you. Bo, I love you. We had, a, we had a good time. Didn't we have a good time? Look at this. Didn't we have a good time? All these years, all these years of recovery and the lives and the people that have come to us. And we just gave them enough information to keep them going. Keep them going. Narcotics Anonymous is getting stronger. Yes, it is. Narcotics Anonymous will be a, a here for a long time, but the torch is being passed to a new generation of addicts who will come to understand, love, and grow in our fellowship. They will join us. They will make our, our, our leaving a little bit more easier because they were here, not because we were here. It's not always what we taught. Them, it's what they teach us. Uh -huh. It did not get any better out there. It did not get any better out there. Mm -hmm. Crack a teal. Mm. Now we're gonna get it. Now we're gonna get it. All right, you want to get it? You're gonna get it now. It's always about the drugs. Mm -hmm. Don't lose sight of it. Crack a teal, the worst drug in Russia that's now in America. Mm. Cocaine. Morphine, methadone, alcohol, gasoline, codeine. And you have to find somebody to cook it. Because not everybody knows how to cook it right. And you know what it does to the addict? It rots the flesh right off your body. Mm. They're selling orange gel and baking soda. Mm -hmm. They're doing ecstasy and Viagra. Mm -hmm. Sextasy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the bottom is, you can pitch a tent for about a month and your left ventricle is blown out. <laughs> I got to Connecticut. They said, um, I said, well, what kind of, you know, that pot, what are you smoking? And they, it's, it has embalming fluid in it. I said, so, well, what's the high? An out of the body experience? <laughs> They'll put anything in it, anything on it, step on it 50 times, and, you know, sprayed with the gasoline and the roach kicker for that extra kick. Later for your lives. Later for your people, later for your friends, and fentanyl, and heroin, and oxycontin, and here goes all the youth. Here goes all the members, all the youth, all the kids. They're all going for it. They don't even know that they're not going to wake up the next day. They don't even know. They don't even know what's in it. You know, where's the protection? It's right here. It's right here. And Narcotics Anonymous is the protection. Each of us, just by staying clean, we can help somebody. We can help. If we help one person, it's almost like Schindler's List when he wanted to sell the car to get one or two more people out. That's the way I feel about Narcotics Anonymous, if I can get somebody out of it. And see, that disease was on me because it was in my mouth. I always said an arm's length away. No, it was in my mouth, and I didn't even know that I did it to myself. I wasn't paying attention. But God, you never, you never put a question mark where God puts a period. Because if I wanted to use, this planet wouldn't be safe. Mm. I was treacherous. I was treacherous. I was of no use to God and the people around me. Now I'm of maximum use to God and the people around me. If you've been clean for 24 years, 24 months, 24 weeks, 24 days, 24 hours, 
44 minutes, God has blessed you. Thank you for allowing me the privilege to share with you.